hear me? Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Today I will be telling you about our unpublished work, so you can give me feedback. Um, in the lab we do three things. I will always say I do three things because if I say more, it get, uh, we get lost. So I always try to say three things for everything. So one of the things we do is to model uh, behavior and I will be talking about uh, modeling collective behavior. We are also neuroscientists, so we are looking at brain activity while the animals are in groups or interacting with other animals. There is another path in the lab that is exploring new uh, approaches to machine learning or AI. I will be talking about modeling collective behavior, but I will tell you one minute about uh, our work in, uh, in brains by just showing you a video. So here what we have is a, an animal, a zebrafish. This one might be nine days old or 10 days old. It's embedded in agarose. Agarose is uh, transparent. The animal is intact. We don't open the animal, uh, but it's trapped in agarose. We can actually remove a bit of agarose so it can move the tail. And it can also, we, re we can also remove uh, agarose from the eyes and it can move then the eyes and the tail. In this particular video, we didn't remove anything so the image is a bit more uh, clear. And what you're going to see is the brain activity. We are expressing uh, genetically calcium indicators in, in this case in all, the, in all the brain. So you will see uh, calcium changes that are coming from uh, the brain activity and in red there will be a tracking of another fish around this one. Because the brain turns out to respond uh, in the contralateral side to the fish, I flipped the trajectory so it's easier to see the, animal, the other animal close to brain activity on this side. So I'm going to run the video. Let's see whether the image, this is raw data, it's not treated data. So you can maybe see. You can already imagine the correlations between the position of the other animal and where in the brain gets active. This is normal epifluorescence. We can do better, but this is just to show to you. If you treat the data in a very simple way and you ask yourself which part of the, oh, sorry, which part of the brain is uh, responding to what position of the other animal, let's say that these are the positions of the other animal in different colors, and for example, this part of the brain is responding to this position of the animal, this one to that. So that's our reason to choose zebrafish. We can do both behavior in collectives in the lab. We can manipulate the brain. We can record brain activity. Uh, so it's quite powerful to use this, this system. Um, as I explained to you before, one other uh, part of the lab is trying to explore new approaches to AI. In particular, we are trying to see how far we can get doing uh, some kind of machine learning without function minimization. So if you are curious about what we are doing, this is an archive paper uh, about our approach. It's based on modern algebra and it doesn't use functions. Anyway, today I will uh, stick to modeling behavior and uh, in the past we've done it in different ways. Our philosophy has always been similar to many of you to use very simple models that could give insight about what the animals are doing. And I want to explain a bit of that philosophy to basically make myself the enemy of myself and say, okay, there is a limit to what you can do with very simple models. And today I will explore with you what happens if we go into very complicated models and how best maybe to do it. Anyway, so the type of things we've been doing, for example, was to start, in my case, because I come, well, I was a physicist in a, two lives before, uh, in my previous life maybe a neuroscientist, 
I tend to produce these uh, models based on ideas of neuroscience. For example, one we've been playing with is the idea that what an animal is doing is to estimate the probability that there is something out in the world given what is seen and given also the behaviors of other agents. So we've been working with that idea using very simple models and uh, it has been quite successful for very simple experiments. That doesn't give you the whole picture. Uh, we've been trying to model other parts of uh, collective behavior, one of them how an animal approaches another using control theory for uh, coordination, basically using the idea of minimal time in a burst and glide uh, fish. For animal fights, we've been using game theory, we've been using heuristic rules, but in other cases, very simple models. Let me illustrate one of the more complicated ones, but it's still very simple, from the idea that what brains are doing is to estimate something out in the world by not only using your private information, but also the information of what other agents are doing, you can come up with, without some assumptions, uh, with very simple uh, predictions for experiments. In this particular case, we have this experiment in which our focal animal is choosing between two options, X and Y, with different animals to, in X and different animals in, in Y. So this is the formula we get from that idea of that, the, the, that animals are estimating. And in this particular case, it has uh, two variables, number of animals at X and number of animals at Y, and three parameters, K, S, and A. And uh, here I'm plotting NX and Y and my formula here that gives me this surface that depends on the values of the parameters. And I can change in the experiment the number of animals in each of the two options in X and Y. So imagine I change the animals in X and I have two and one in Y, that would be the prediction. You do the experiment, you compare. So you see, it's only two variables and uh, three parameters, and for me, it's already a bit of a nightmare model. I mean, it's uh, from the theory you need to simplify to, to, to go this simple, but it still has a few parameters. So why I'm not happy with this, and why I'm going to spend 30 minutes talking about something else. The reason is that, as you can see, the, the experiment is very simple, and the theory has been matched to the simplicity of the experiment, and that's why it can be very simple. I think that's a very fruitful approach, but it's limited to always been doing very simple experiments. So what happens if we now do a more complicated experiment? Can we use this type of models? But in general, no, we cannot. It captures some part of the, of the behavior, but not the totality. So you now imagine that you want to apply this previous model to an animals moving in a group. Let's say I put my zebra fish in a tank and I let them move, and I see how accurate uh, is the, imagine I try to predict at each point in time whether the animal is going to move to the right or to the left, depending on the configuration of animals, and I plot what is the accuracy of my model. I mean, 50% is the chance, so 70% is something, but okay, you manage to capture that maybe with uh, one or two or three parameters, but you are far from a uh, very good prediction, okay? So what can you do? You can try, this is fake data, by the way, but just to illustrate the point. You can try to do uh, models with more variables and with more parameters. Now this is, again, a bit trivial, because at some point you're going to have enough variables and parameters to really explain your training data, because that's what happens. I mean, with enough parameters, you can explain whatever you want. So one requirement is going to be that we are not going to use training data except to fit the models, but we are going to fit them in a way that, that they should be tested in new data, okay? We are not happy fitting the data, but we are happier we can predict what the animal is going to do, oh, sorry, in, uh, in new data. Now, I will go all the way to a large number of uh, variables, but I will argue also that we should play with systems to have less and less number of variables so we can have some insight. So today I'm not going to make the point that you should 
have full insight with very few variables. I'm not going to say that you, have, you should have these type of systems. What I will argue in general is that it should not be there, OK? So you are better off always being in that curve, either getting lots of insight with very simple models or more ability to predict with larger models, but you should never be in the stupid region of modeling. For today, I'm going to forget, I'm not going to do a talk on the work we have published, but only on how far we can get using deep nets. Um, there are reasons to use deep nets. One is that for many problems is the most general function approximator we have. So it's very good at approximating data. In the last few years, let's say 2017, there were many practical advances to use deep nets. They are coming out all the time. There are reasons not to use them, and probably you have those reasons. One is that there's a bit of black magic in how to use them, and also they can act as black boxes. So during the talk, I am a bit divided. I, I, have, I believe that there is some value in using them, but you will, by yourself, decide whether you are one of these people that want to use them or not. Because it's true that there is some black magic. There is actually some black magic in our modeling. Um, and to some extent, there are black boxes, but we, we will play with them to see how far we can get. I will try to talk about three things. Maybe I don't have time for the last one. One is to give you an update on our tracking system uh, using deep nets. Another one is to, uh, from data obtained in this, uh, in this tracking system, how we can build models using deep nets. The last one I have, if I have time, I will tell you our efforts in using reinforcement learning in modeling collective behavior. Our idea for tracking a few years ago was that, as uh, Stefania was saying, that when two animals go into a region of occlusion, our idea was that to know who was who afterwards, you would look at the images. There would be a way of looking at the images that would give you a fingerprint of the animal. So this is George and this is Tom, and just by analyzing the images afterwards, you will see that that was Tom and that was George. And if you do that, we had a, a way of doing it using a, a kind of a texture analysis that was invariant under rotations and translations. You can see that in a video in 2D and here time, th there is a trajectory here for eight animals and in color where the, uh, the tracking system agrees with a human validator and in black, which you might not be able to see, the little regions in which they disagree. Now we thought, okay, this, this system, some people use it. Uh, it has the limitation, probably Guy has been the one trying to push it to more animals. I think maybe they are trying to use like 20 or 40. How far did you go? How many? 20. Yeah, so that's about the limit of this system. After 20, you need to be very patient to get the results. It's very slow and uh, it might crash. So we, we thought a few years ago, why not to use convolutional neural networks? These are deep networks that instead of the typical classification all-to-all -all connections network, it has some convolutional layers. These are filters that are looking at the image in little patches and they are designed to be translational invariant. And these are well known. I mean, everyone is using them. And okay, let's, let's test the idea of whether convolutional neural networks can distinguish animals. So in general, we don't have a way for all animal species to find the nose, let's say, or the head. We can do it in zero fish, but we thought in general it cannot be done, so we would, we, all we do is to put the elongated uh, region of the animal in this diagonal. It can be this way or that way, because we are not distinguishing head from tail, so what we do, we train the network with uh, all these images, irrespective of, of the orientation, and we try to see by giving these inputs to the network whether it can learn 
some, the identities of some, some individuals. To test the idea, to obtain some ground truth, we obtained videos, the image is not very good, of 184 animals. The, they are in independent uh, little tanks, so we know who is who. That's our ground truth. We have all these images for the 184 animals. It's 10,000 of them. So this is our library to do a test of any network. So how do we test it? We take uh, 3,000 images to train the network, 2,700 for training, 300 images to stop the training when uh, it can still give good uh, predictions of who is who in a new data set, in this validation data set. And then we test in uh, another data set of 300 images. For that test data set, we obtain for a single image the following accuracy. So this is single image accuracy, and that's the group size, the number of individuals that uh, need to be identified, 2, 10, 30, 60, 80, 100, 150. ID tracker is some, somewhere here, and the new system with uh, CNNs is uh, much better. This is not to say that ID tracker was really bad here, because it is a single image. Between two crossings, you have many images, so you can uh, estimate better the who is who, but uh, still, this means that for the new system, you need very few images between two crossings to know who is who. And as you can see, magically, uh, it doesn't degrade that much for very large groups. Okay, so this is a little proof that the system can cope in distinguishing 150 uh, of my fish, okay? Now, this is not to say that it will work in a, in a video. And the reason for that is that we are training the system with 3,000 images. In a video, I'm not going to have a straight away 3,000 images for each individual. So I run into a, a huge problem. I need to obtain my 3,000 images per individual. I, I will explain how we do it, but this is for you to see the complexity of the problem. The animals are crossing uh, very often. So it would be unlikely that I have a portion of the video in which I have 3,000 images per individual. By the way, this is the 30-day-old zero fish. Okay, so the core of our tracking system is really here. It's a quality check procedure to gather together many uh, training images and I will run you through it so you can modify it by, by yourself for your needs. So after the pre-processing I told you, we have a crossing detector. What is a crossing detector? It's another network that what it does is to find in the video when two animals are crossing. So we have some heuristics to find some of these crossings, uh, basically based on the number of pixels in the blob, whether they're going to form two blobs afterwards, so they come from two blobs in the past. And then we have this as training data sets for crossings. And then we have also data set from the video obtained as individuals, another one for crossings. So we have another network, it's a bit simpler, but we train the network only on two outputs, whether it's a crossing or it's an individual. We use the training images that we obtain with our heuristics and then the network will tell us in the video which images correspond to crossings and which to individuals. This is our test set, that in our case it will be the whole video, and this is what you find. I'm here plotting in the y-axis my 100 animals in the video, and this is frame number. I will put in black the little fragments of the video in which my network is telling me that the animals are crossings, and in white, when they are individuals. So this is the result of that crossing network. Okay, now what we need is to identify all the animals in, in between. And as I was telling you before, the way we do it is by carefully adding uh, images for a training data set. Let's start with the first part, which already would work for simple videos. 
For more complex videos, it jumps into a new protocol. And for the super complicated ones that I never want to be in, to protocol three. OK, so the first thing to do is to find the portions of the video in which the animals are not crossing. Typically, in a video of our fish, we have for 10 minutes 100 of, of those, some of them very short, but still 100. For example, by eye, I could see here three. So I asked the system to find one of those, and I asked the system to find the one in which the animal traveling the shortest travels the farthest in the video. So I find this global fragment, and all I do is to train my network on those uh, in, on that data. So I have images for animal number one to up to 100. There are very few, but that's how I start. This is my training data set. I keep something for validation so I don't over train. I train my network and I train it to identify all the individuals because they are not crossing. And then what I do is to ask how the network will assign the rest of the video. This is my test set. Now, it's going to assign the whole video, but in general, it's going to be shit. So I want a quality check. My quality check, I don't go into the details. It has an internal way of uh, finding whether it's certain about the uh, assignment. It's also checking other things that there are no uh, two blobs identify to the same animal. And out of that quality check, I only retain those global fragments that have high quality. In this case, are these ones here. And my quality check also says, oh, are they covering a lot of the video? No. OK, I'm done. I don't like protocol one. You can still use it. The accuracy will not be close to 100%. Maybe it's like a 90%. But you want fast tracking. This might be a way to do it. But you will need to go into the code and change a bit one parameter in the quality check, because in our case, we don't consider it valid. It jumps into protocol two, which is the one I really use for most of my videos. In that one, all that happens is that I now use this uh, global fragments as training data set for my network. Again, I train the network, and I assign Again, the rest of the video, now I have more global fragments that have passed the quality check. They are still not covering the video as much as I want. So I ask the system to do it again and again. It does step three, four, five, and step nine. It has covered most of the video. The internal quality check says, okay, it's enough of the video. And uh, we are done with the protocols. In the difficult cases, we'll jump to protocol three. But here, for fish, I never had that situation. It always was with protocol two. OK, so we are here at step nine. Protocol three, I will mention only that sometimes the network cannot just move along the video. And I have to force the convolutional part of the network to learn about the whole video. And then only the classification part in a second step uh, retrain it. So I force the network to see the whole video. But I, most of the time, we don't use it. OK, so if I zoom in my video, you will see that there are some little parts I didn't identify. And also, the crossings are still there. So there, we have another part of the algorithm that uh, finds the assignation of those little fragments and also estimates the accuracy. It's a conservative method to estimate accuracy. You don't see the histogram here very well. The mean value of the estimation is 99.95% accuracy in the identification of all the animals. And when you have a human validator, it goes up, because it's a conservative measure that we are using. It goes to 99.997. So out of 10,000 frames, you will have uh, three problems with uh, identification, and typically it's animals that are close and it's for one frame. OK, so we learned that it works quite well. But then we need to also solve the crossings. So we have another algorithm to solve the crossings. And once you go through that algorithm, in the end you have, oops, sorry, you have your 
trajectories for the tracking system. I'm going to show you two cases. The one I was showing to you before, our fish and the ants. In the case of ants, it's a difficult case. It jumps actually to protocol three, and the reason for that is that, uh, as you can see at the beginning of the video, many of the ants are still, so the training system only has basically one image, and it doesn't have enough variability to learn more of the, of the ant, so I need to force the system to learn a bit. But you will see at some point they start to move, and for ID tracker, this situation, the previous ID tracker was an impossible one. With the new one, it's, it's possible. Okay, so let me quickly tell you that the code is open source and has a nice GUI and uh, documentation. Let me quickly move to a way of doing models using AI uh, in a data-driven way. And what we want to do now is from our videos is to see how we can, for example, in this case, predict the position of this animal given the positions and velocities or possibly accelerations of the other animals. So imagine that I want to predict the future of this animal and the animal is going to be here in one second and I want to predict the position and my prediction is going to be there. If you now ask a deep net to learn this problem, it's actually a very difficult problem to learn and you use a naive deep net, it will not learn it. But in 2017, there were improvements on deep nets that make it to learn. So you can see the real and the predicted one. I'm going to tell you very quickly how this works. So the ideas are in this paper, it's a method to, was used to mimic uh, physics, and we are going to use it for uh, modeling fish. So on the left, you have the physics implementation, on the right, the deep net implementation, and you can see that they work closely. Okay, so it works quite well if you look at the turning angle of the animal one second in the future against the accuracy of the system already works quite well with no neighbors because already by knowing that the animal is accelerating to the left, you're going to know a bit of the future. But if you add five, 10 or 15 neighbors, this network has a very high accuracy at predicting whether it's going to turn right or left, close to 90%. And that's the maximum we have achieved with any network. You can use this network for data analysis you can have to the right the probability of going the focal to the, to the right. You can find configurations in which the animal will go to the right, but you can also, because the model is an interpolation, you can go there, say, okay, I want George to have a different velocity, a different position, and I want to find out whether the focal animal is going to move to the right or to the left. You can play with the model and get some intuition of what are the uh, variables to consider. But let me go through the theory so you can have a sense of what we are doing. So the network can be represented in this way. Now it looks like a little monster, but I'm going to introduce it more slowly. So it has one object here, which is a little network that is going to describe the interaction of my focal animal and another animal. I'm going to use a coordinate system centered at the focal, so the focal is at zero, zero, and with the velocity pointing in the y-axis. So the, the variables I'm going to consider for it are going to be the speed and the acceleration to the, in the perpendicular direction to the, to the speed. For the focal, we've been trying different variables, but the ones that seem to work quite well is the position of the focal respect, sorry, the position of the neighbor respect to the focal and the velocity as well respect to the focal velocity. Now, the network we are using here in the simulation you just saw is a very rich one that has six variables as input, but it will have 128 uh, outputs. And the reason to have many of those outputs is that this is just describing the interaction between two animals, and we need some other part of the network to do that aggregation of all, all these uh, interactions, and for that we use this rich output from this network. 
So what we have after these little networks, G, is a sum of those uh, little networks for my 15 individuals, and then that has 128 outputs, and I have another network that takes the 128 outputs and transforms it into a future position of my focal animal. Okay, so that's a nightmare black box problem because basically you have 16 variables uh, per neighbor. There were, we were using 15 neighbors, and there were two variables for the focal. That's 92 variables and lots of parameters. Can we do better at getting some insight of what a model of the fish might be? We can, but let's go slowly. One insight we are getting at this network working is that we are using first, it has some structure. It's not a network of all to all neurons. It has some structure. The beginning of the, of the structure is that I'm describing the interaction between a pair of animals, one focal and another neighbor. And the rest of the network is an aggregation of that. So let's try to mimic that network by using a simpler one that we can understand. The interaction one we can understand a bit. It has six variables, but it's not uh, super complicated. Instead of having 128 outputs, I'm going to have a single one, and I'm going to train that to be the probability that the focal animal goes to the right, given the variables for the focal and the variables for that neighbor. So basically, now I'm transforming six variables, these six inputs, into a single output instead of 128. Let's plot that. So this is the result of the network. It has six variables, so we needed to look at a six-dimensional plot, and I'm going to do it in the following way. The reason is it's not that difficult to look at six variables in this case because they, are, they mean different things. So one is the space, so the position of the neighbor in X, the position of the neighbor in Y. This is my focal. It has two uh, variables. One is the speed. So if it has high speed, I have a large arrow. And if it has acceleration to the right, I will have an arrow to the right. I don't have an arrow to the right, so the acceleration to the right is zero. And now I have these little diagrams. And basically, they are plotting the velocity of the neighbor here, we have the angle of the velocity vector of the neighbor respect to the velocity vector of the focal, and here is the speed. So this is just, these plots are giving you the probability that the focal animal goes to the right in red and to the left, to the not right, in blue. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that if a neighbor is in this position of the, my plot, the neighbor is uh, moving uh, to the right, and what this animal is going to do is just to move to the right. That's what this plot says. An animal here in a space with that velocity vector, so higher speed, and moving to the right makes my focal animal to move to the right. If it's on the blue part, it means that the neighbor is moving to the left and is again here moving at higher speed, so my animal moves to the left, according to the plot. Now, it gets more complicated and more interesting, so there are some portion of the space in which if my neighbor is not moving at high speed, independently of whether it's moving to the left or to the right, my focal animal is moving to the right. So there are parts of the space in which if the other animal, the neighbor, is not moving fast, it's only an attraction part. Here it's going to align, but here it's only going to attract. There are regions uh, you cannot see it in this plot because the uh, quality of the projector is not that good. So this part here was blue. You, look, you, look, you, you find it being white, but it's blue, which means that there is a repulsion of the neighbor to the, to the focal when it's going at uh, low velocity. The high velocity is not, re, not, not producing repulsions, but a low, a low velocity is producing repulsion. Now, another variable was the velocity of uh, my focal animal. If I plot the same thing than before, but uh, for my focal going at low velocity, you can see that it's only this region that is more important. There's still repulsion in some regions. Repulsion is more important than before, and it's more restricted in space. So how it reacts to a neighbor depends also on the velocity 
of the focal, and as well on the acceleration normal to the velocity. If the animal is turning to the right, the evidence to move in the opposite side needs to be at very high velocities. Only a neighbor at very high velocity pointing to the other side will make it change its direction. But all the plot turns more red. Okay, so, so far we've been looking at uh, the simple interaction between focal and one neighbor. Before we had another function uh, afterwards, another network to take that into account. It was very complicated, so now we are moving to a different network, which is called attention network. That was studied re recently. The idea is to keep the network we were talking about before, but it has now some weight. So it's weighting the animals with this other function that it needs to learn to produce a good probability of moving to the right or to the left. We found that uh, this really depends mostly on four variables, the speed of the two animals and the position of the neighbor. So I'm going to plot to you when the system learns to produce these weights, which are relative weights, they are normalized weights. One obtains for the exponential of this new function, something like this. So it's the same thing than before, but now there is no dependency on the angle. What it finds is these regions of interest to weight the animals that are on those regions. So animals at higher speed on these particular regions would be important for a focal animal at higher speed. The way you read this is that if you have, for example, two of the 15 animals up there, their score is very high, and if the other ones are lower, it's very likely that these two win out, and my focal is going to follow the direction of those two. But depending on whether the others are, that's not, that might not be the case. If the others are also having lower but higher, higher scores to move to the, to the right, in the end those will win out and my focal will move to the right because all these are relative weights. And again, for low velocities, the way you aggregate the information is different. You are doing it more locally and not with the far individuals. Okay, so I had one more thing, but probably I'm late, no? Am I late? Do I have some time or four minutes? Okay. So I will very quickly just, we don't have very good results for the next thing, so I can be quick. So we are using the deep nets, as I showed to you, <clears throat> for our tracking system to build models in a data-driven way, but also in a top-down way, as I'm going to describe quickly here. Basically, we're using agents that have a little brain, and we're using reinforcement learning, which is a method to change the parameters of the brain, of the little network, in a way that obeys a score we give to the system. So what we have in reinforcement learning is the idea that the world is in a particular state that is learned by the agent, and the agent takes some actions that modify the environment, and then the agent reacts again to the, to the environment. So basically, in this scenario, you will have a world in which you have other agents. I produce a retina for my, for my agent that has six, 160 values on a sphere, in this particular case, a very little brain of three layers. And the actions he can take in 3D space are very simple here, the speed and two angles. And uh, afterwards, there is some physics that describes the movement of the animal given the actions he has taken. And the animal needs to learn to modify this net to maximize a score we give to the system. And this has, like, it was a nightmare to, to really use this uh, agent, type of agents before, but now there are little tricks developed recently at the end of last year that makes this much faster. So the type of questions you can ask, for example, is does it exist a sensory motor transformation, so a particular set of parameter values? that produces behavior X. So now we are basically have a rich model that can be many types of models, and we want the animal to do behavior X. We say, okay, do behavior X, and I'll find out whether it's possible to actually find a particular brain, sensory motor transformation that produces uh, behavior X. As an example, I, I'm going to show you not so good calculations on to the question of 
of uh, do we need to add a blight angle to this particular agent to have a milling pattern in behavior? And the answer is, well, I don't really know, but this is the answer numerically. So numerically, you can manage having a score that asks the animal, uh, gives a higher score if it's going to produce milling, basically a high angular momentum, and some attraction and some repulsion. They learn the animals to be together, and you have this, I'm not sure I should call milling, but they, they are rotating. So they are still learning. As we speak, they are learning, so, so they are still in their way to produce milling. And I believe this type of modeling will be very important in the near future because there will be tricks that uh, make this faster in better and better computers. And now it's getting fairly easy to produce a world for them uh, that is reasonable. And with this, I want to just finish by saying, yes, there is black magic. There's black magic in all the modeling I do. There is a bit more maybe in these systems because the trick is to add some structure to them that makes sense for the problem so they can learn from the data. Sometimes it will be black boxes. We don't mind about black boxes to some extent, for example, for a tracking system. We do mind for modeling uh, behavior. And in that case, I propose that instead of using the best predictive networks, we reduce their complexity in a way that we can still plot and understand them so we can keep knowing how far a network can go, we can reduce the number of variables to be able to plot it, and we can also go back to our models of one or two or three parameters. And with that, I will finish just to acknowledge the people that did the work. So the, they are really four people. So uh, Francisco Romero and Matia Bergomi coded the, the tracking system. Francisco Eras did the modeling work using uh, interaction and attention networks, and uh, Robert Hinz did the experiments. With this, I'll, I'll finish. Thank you.